I set before you just a single verse from the 30th chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah. It is verse 15. This is the word of God. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> Dr. F. B. Meyer, the great biblical scholar of another day, tells of sailing one dark and starless night across the Irish Channel. As they sailed the waters at night, Dr. Meyer asked the ship's captain, tell me, sir, he said, how do you know the location of Hollyhead Harbor on such a dark night as this? And the captain replied, Dr. Meyer, do you see those three lights burning on the distant horizon? We sail until those three lights appear to line up one behind the other so that from the sea they look as if they are one. And when we see those three lights so united one behind the other, then we know the precise location of the entrance to the harbor. F. B. Meyer took those words from the ship's captain and applied them to our search for God's will. He said, there are three things which must line up in agreement. God in the heart speaking to you about his way. God in the Bible confirming to you what he says in your heart. And God in the circumstances opening for you doorways of opportunity. Never start, Dr. Meyer said, until all three have been lined up in agreement. Well now, I want to borrow Dr. Meyer's words and apply them to this sermon to say to you that yes, there are indeed three things which need to line up if we are going to have some idea of God's will for us in life. God speaking in the heart, God speaking in the Bible, and God speaking in the circumstances of life. Come along with me for a, a while and let's look more closely at each. First, there is God speaking in the heart. Now this is a call to the discipline of stillness and prayer in our lives. Do you remember what Isaiah said? In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Rest and quietness are two key elements in seeing God's leading in your life. It was Thomas Carlyle who said, it is in silence that great things fashion themselves. And you know that's true. And it's especially true, I think, in the realm of the spirit. For ever since Elijah, you and I have known that God's voice is a still, small voice. When God speaks, he speaks gently. 
when God delivered to us His most profound Word. That is, when the Word became flesh, when the Lord Jesus Christ was born. That event was not accompanied by sounding brass and thundering drums. No, as a matter of fact, it took place in the birth of a little baby, in a stable behind an inn, in a little out-of-the-way place called Bethlehem, in the middle of a very dark and quiet night. When God speaks, God speaks gently. And God is best heard in stillness, in silence. Now, please don't misunderstand me in this call to stillness in our lives. I'm not standing here today and trying to advocate some kind of wholesale return to nature. And I'm not suggesting that all of us are to go out and become 20th century Henry David Thoreau's. And I'm certainly not talking about such petty and meaningless diversions as transcendental meditation and the like. No, no, not at all. No, I am simply saying to you today that every single one of us ought to have some quiet place in our lives. Doesn't matter where it is. It may be in your bedroom or at the office or in your backyard or in a wooded glen or on a park bench or in the chapel of our church. It doesn't matter where it is. But all of us ought to have some quiet place in life where we can go each day and for just 10 or 15 minutes sit in stillness and let the silence sweep away the litter in our minds, thus clearing the way for God to speak to us. And also don't misunderstand me in this call to prayer because I'm not advocating some kind of false Gethsemane and you need to know that. You know, that's the way it is with many Christians. In seeking God's will for life, what do they do? Well, they try to dictate to God everything that they want. They lay out before him a long list of their desires, and they say, Lord, this is what I want. And then, almost as an afterthought, they kind of hook on to the end of that prayer, the holy words from Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. It's just an afterthought. They see God's will as, as one of life's little extras. Well, I'm not talking about God's will as an extra, as an afterthought. I'm talking about making the pursuit of God's will absolutely central in your life. Do you remember what Jesus said? It's in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John, the 34th verse. Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of my Father in heaven. My meat, my food, my sustenance is to do the will of my heavenly Father. My daily strength comes from pursuing what my God wants me to do in life. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about seeking God's will because you're forced to do it or because you're supposed to do it. No. I'm talking about pursuing God's will because you want to do it because you want to know His will for you and because you want to experience it every single day that you live in the living of your own life. That's what I'm talking about. And, and you know, that's precisely what Augustine had in mind when he prayed, O oh Lord, our hearts are restless until they rest in Thee. Yes, that's the first thing that needs to be lined up in seeking God's will in life. The discipline of prayer and stillness in your experience. God speaking in your heart. But secondly, there is God speaking in the Bible. This is a call to the discipline of the study of the Scriptures. Again, you remember what Isaiah said? In returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Well, you see, the key word in that part of it, I think, is returning. And when Isaiah speaks of returning, he's talking about turning again to the Lord. And the best way for us to turn again to the Lord is to turn to His Word, which is this book, the Bible. 
for this book is indeed God's direct personal word to every single one of us. You're aware of the fact that, that down in southern France there is a province where when a boy and a girl become serious about one another, they are said to be talking to one another. Isn't that beautiful? And you know, it's so true. That little bit of folk wisdom has a very profound message because you see, that's always where real love begins in conversation. Heart knowledge always begins with head knowledge. It is in the exchange of words that we are able to build our human relationships. And the same thing is true of our relationship with God. There must be the exchange of words. And so when we go to a quiet place and we pray, well, that's when we are talking to God. That's the one-way conversation. But we must also permit God to speak to us. And the fact of the matter is that the way God most often speaks to his people is through the pages of his book, the Bible. Again, do not misunderstand me. I am not standing here today and saying to you that we are to use the Bible like some kind of spiritual Ouija board. No, not at all. You know, there's some people who do that. <laughs> I love the story about the fellow who desperately wanted to know God's will for his life. So you know what he did? He took his Bible and he flipped it open to a page and he did his finger up in the air and he went around and around and he stuck his finger down on the page and then he looked to see where his finger was pointing and it said, and Judas went out and hanged himself. <laughs> Whoo, that shook him. And so he said, hmm, I, I think I better give this another try. So he opened the Bible up, did his finger around, put it down on the page and he read, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> Whee, he was desperate now. One more time, he said, something's got to happen here. So he closed his Bible and he opened it up and he did his finger in the air and he put it down on the page and he looked, what thou doest, do quickly. <laughs> you get the point. We are not to use the Bible as some kind of book of magic. We're to study it. Yes, we are to study it wisely, carefully, intelligently. You know how it is. If someone you love dies, you're not simply going to flip your Bible open and start reading at any page. No, you're going to turn to those passages which will speak to you in your specific need. You're going to turn to passages like Psalm 23 or 1 Corinthians 15 or John 14 or 1 Thessalonians 4. You're going to turn to passages which you know will speak to that need. Well, just so. In seeking God's will for your life, whatever the question may be, when you go to prayer and when you give yourself to the study of the Scriptures, be sure that you're studying the Scriptures in relationship to what you're praying about. Go to those passages which will speak to the need that you have at that point in your life. I don't care what it is. It may be a, a vocational decision. It may be a marital difficulty. It may be some temptation you're struggling against. It may be a, a choice about, about whom you will marry or where you will go to college. It may be a consideration of how you're going to spend your time or your money in life. It doesn't matter. The Bible somewhere in all of its pages, the Bible somewhere has appropriate passages to speak to your need. And that's why I think it's so important for us as Christians to have a topical concordance or a chain reference to go right along with our Bible so that, you see, we can then take certain thoughts or themes or ideas and we can follow them all the way through the pages of Scripture, thus giving God ample opportunity to speak. So pray. Get to that quiet place and pray. And then study the Scriptures. Read them wisely. Read them as they relate to your need. And then think long and hard about what you've read. And if you do those two things, then most often that will be the point where God's Holy Spirit will move into your experience and will begin to sweep away the clouds of confusion and God's will for your life can become abundantly clear. That's the second thing, to line up in agreement. God speaking in the heart, yes, but also God speaking in the Bible. But there's a third thing, God speaking in the circumstances of life. 
This is a call to the discipline of being sensitive to the way God works in the world, to be aware of the fact that God is at work in the events that surround us every day. You remember what Isaiah said? In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Trust, that's a key element in learning God's will for your life. We've got to learn to trust God to reveal His will to us, and He will do that through the circumstances that are around us. He will begin in the midst of those circumstances to make a way for us if we are, in fact, in pursuit of that will. But if, oh, if, if you are still not quite sure, that is, if you give yourself to the discipline of prayer and the discipline of study, and if you take a look at the circumstances around you and you're still not quite sure what it is that God wants you to do in life, well, at that point, I'm going to suggest to you that you lay out a fleece. <laughs> you know where that phrase comes from, don't you? Lay out a fleece? That comes from the sixth chapter of the book of Judges. It's the story of Gideon. Gideon was, was in the process of being enlisted to the service of Almighty God. God was after him. And Gideon wasn't quite sure what it was that God wanted him to do. So old Gideon said, Lord, I'm not sure what it is that you want me to do, so I'm going to, I'm going to propose a test for you. I'm going to lay out a fleece. And tonight, I want you to cause the dew to fall on that fleece so that the fleece is wet and the ground around it's dry. And if you do that, then I'll know what it is you want me to do. That night, the Lord was at work. Next morning, Gideon got up, went out, picked up the fleece. It was soaking wet, and the ground around it was bone dry. I want to tell you something. That would have been enough for me. But that wasn't enough for Gideon. Gideon was no gambler. He wanted a sure thing. And so Gideon said, Lord, that was very impressive but I'm still not sure just what it is that you want me to do. So, tonight, I'm going to lay out the fleece again, but this time, well, this time, I want the fleece to be dry and the ground around it to be wet. And the next morning, it was so. And the Bible says so beautifully, so simply, Gideon obeyed the Lord and did magnificent things in the power of God. I love that. And on the basis of what I learned from Gideon, I want to suggest to you that you can lay out a fleece. You see, a fleece is some test where you say to the Lord, Lord, I'm not sure what it is precisely that you want me to do, but if you want me to do this, then let such and such happen. Now, I know the very minute that I say that, there are going to be some of you, there may even be a lot of you, who will want to stand up and say, come on, preacher, you know, we are never to put the Lord to the test. Where did you get that idea? Are you aware of the fact that the witness of the Scriptures is exactly the opposite of that? In fact, not only does God say, put me to the test, but all the way through the Scriptures there are individuals who do put him to the test. Gideon tested him. Thomas the disciple tested him. The rich young ruler tested him. Even his own son Jesus tested him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what I want you to hear is this, that God answered Gideon, and God answered Thomas, and God answered the rich young ruler, and God answered his own son, Jesus. Oh, it wasn't necessarily the answer that they wanted, but God did answer them, and he will answer you. Please do not misunderstand me. This business of laying out a fleece is serious. And if you're ever to the point in life where you feel the need to lay out a fleece, then you better remember that there are four basic rules that are going to have to be adhered to strictly and completely. Here they are. Rule number one, you can lay out a fleece, but only as a last resort. You can't use a fleece to cover every little question and anxiety that you encounter in the course of your life. No, usually, God's going to be able to make his will clear to you if you give yourself to the discipline of prayer and the discipline of the study of the scriptures. But in those rare occasions in life, when you run slap into a brick wall which you can't crack with your prayers or with your study, at that moment, in those rare instances, yes, as a last resort, you can lay out a fleece. Rule number two, 
you have to be sure that the test is something which will require the intervention of God. It has to be a real test of God's power. It can't be something that just may happen in the normal course of events anyway. It has to be a test of God's power. And it has to be something which will not require God to hurt someone else in order to answer your test. You've got to be very careful about that. Don't ever put God in the position of having to choose between you and someone else. Don't ask him to do it. Rule number three, you've got to be willing to take a risk yourself. <laughs> you see, the fact of the matter is that the great things you're praying for and hoping for just may not come to pass, and you'll be left with nothing more than your bare face hanging out. The fact of the matter is that God's answer to your test may be a flat refusal, and you've got to be willing to take no for an answer and then live with it. Rule number four, you've got to be ready to obey God's reply, whatever it is. That's serious. I'm saying that you can't lay out a fleece as casually as we sing our hymns. You know we do that, don't we? We sing our hymns so casually. We sing these noble words, and, and do we really mean... Are you aware of the fact that in one of our hymns we sing, listen, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, over mountain or plain or sea. Just suppose God took us up on that. <laughs> or what about this? Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Suppose God said, okay, that's a deal. You see, we're so casual when we sing our hymns, but if you lay out a fleece, you better not be casual. You better be serious. You better be ready to obey God's reply, whatever it is, cost, whatever it may. Well, there they are. Three things which need to line up in agreement in pursuit of God's will. God in the heart, God in the Bible, God in the circumstances of life. When they're lined up in agreement, then I suggest to you that you are well on the way to discovering God's will for your life. I, uh, yes, just one final word. Just one. There was a man and his friend walking down the streets of New York City on Broadway, it was. It was during the rush hour. Suddenly the man said, I hear a cricket. And his friend said, that's absurd. You couldn't possibly hear a cricket in the midst of all of this noise. And the man said, no, I hear a cricket. And he walked over to a garbage can right next to the sidewalk and he lifted it up and there sitting on a pile of papers was a little cricket. And the friend said, that's amazing. And the man said, no, it's not amazing. Not amazing at all, I'll show you. He pulled out of his pocket a little dime and he said, the sound that this dime makes when it hits that pavement is not going to be a whole lot louder than the sound of that cricket. But you watch what happens. And he dropped the dime. And the moment it hit the pavement, pedestrians walking all about them there suddenly stopped and began to look for the fallen coin. And the man turned to his friend and he said, do you see? You can always hear what you're really listening for. Yes. <laughs> That's it. And when it comes to your search for God's will in your life, this is the word that I would leave with you today. By the power of Jesus Christ, you can always hear what you are really listening for. Let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, lead us in the pursuit of your will. Reveal that will to us, and then let us accept that will and make it the very meat, the very sustenance of our daily living to do the work and the will of our Heavenly Father. Through Jesus Christ, amen.